Why don't we stand together as we're able for the reading of Scripture. Danny is going to be reading from Acts chapter 2 for us this morning. Over to you, Danny. They were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these men, are are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. And it continues a bit later in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Please do take your seats. Thank you, Danny. Morning, everyone. How are you? You all right? Good to see you on this happy Pentecost Sunday. And I wonder if I said to you this morning um, that the creator of the universe, the one who created all things, who hung the stars in the sky, who makes the sun rise each and every morning, the one in whose being all of creation is held together, the one that your soul ultimately longs for, the one you are made to be in union with, the one with unmatched power, unmatched glory and goodness beyond anything any of us has yet fully comprehended, this being that we call God, if I told you to wait here, he's going to come. Like wait in this room, this being is going to rock up in this very room. If I told you that if you wait here for long enough, he's going to join us in this room. This eternal being, creator of the universe, he's actually going to make himself known amongst us within the four walls of this building. And you're going to get to meet him this morning. You just have to wait here. If I said that to you this morning, I wonder how long would we wait. Uh, How long would we stay here in this room just waiting, just attentively waiting? How many hours would have to pass, pass by before we got bored or distracted or just gave up altogether? Like, I wonder, would we cancel our lunch plans? You know, would we cancel the reservation at the Cool Pepper, who do a great Sunday roast, by the way, just FYI. You know, would we pack a sleeping bag? You know, would some of you set in for the night, maybe? Would we wait to the 5? Maybe we'd give it to the 5 p.m. service, and if nothing kicked off there, maybe we'd trot on home. Would we start looking at our watches at about 90 minutes? A little bit frustrated that the service is running over. We've all been there. Well, I have, anyway. Eager to crack on with the rest of our Sundays. Because, you know, life is busy, right? 
Well, we just read from the second chapter of Acts about Pentecost, and it's the event that, as Rachel said, marks the birth of the Christian church that has been alive for over 2,000 years. The day when the Holy Spirit is poured out for the first time in this way, when the Holy Spirit would come to live within the followers of Jesus themselves. You know, and in the 21st century, we, we hear about church movements all the time, harking back to this chapter in Acts. You know, how often have you heard, we want to be an Acts 2 church, we want to rediscover the early church movement. Like there's literally dozens and dozens of church planting movements that have started in the last 50 to 100 years with specific reference to Acts 2. You know, and we get it, don't we? Like it sounds like an expression of church that lots of us long for. That's why I kind of tagged it onto the end of the reading in that passage. And it says this, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and and awe came upon every soul. That makes sense to me. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, like, yes, please. And all who believed were together and had things in common. And they sold possessions, and they looked after the poor, and they attended the temple together, and they committed to breaking bread in their homes. And it all just sounds beautiful, like, yes, amen, God, do it again in our day. Let's let the church look more like that. It sounds incredible. But it's interesting, right, because you never start a book from the second chapter, right? No one picks up a book, turns to chapter 2, and starts reading. But this is often what we do with the book of Acts. We turn to the good stuff. You know, we turn to the exciting bit. Um, and probably because chapter 1 isn't that exciting. You know, it doesn't, but it doesn't take a novelist or a mathematician to know you don't get chapter 2 without chapter 1. And so I'm going to spend a little time reflecting on what happened in chapter 1 that set the context for chapter 2. Like, how did we get to this incredible part of the story? Like, what were the apostles doing in chapter 1? And the answer is largely, they were waiting. In chapter 1, the apostles were waiting. They had this 40-day window with the resurrected Jesus. And he promises them that he'll send the Holy Spirit when he leaves. And then he ascends to heaven, which we heard about last week, the ascension, heard about from Darren. But before Jesus ascends, after this 40-day window, he gives them one really simple instruction. And in verse 1, verse 12, we read, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. That is the promise of the Holy Spirit. But he instructs them to wait. Don't depart. Wait here. To wait attentively. To wait with expectation that the Holy Spirit is going to come, that God is going to show up in the room in a new way. And so that's what they do. And we read a few verses later, it says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. And all these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So they returned to where they're staying in Jerusalem, and all with one accord, they devoted themselves to prayer. So they wait, and they pray. And one day goes past, and they keep waiting, like, attentively, you know, lots of us probably would have gone home by that point. You know, we might not have made it to the 5 p.m. service. But a second day goes past, and they keep praying, and they're waiting. God's going to show up in the room. We trust Jesus. He said the Holy Spirit's going to come. And a third day goes past, and you get the picture. They keep waiting. And 10 days they waited in the upper room in Jerusalem. 10 days of expectation, of hunger, of hope. That they prayed, they waited, expectant, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. That the first thing the early followers of Jesus were asked to do after the ascension of Jesus Christ was to wait. And to trust that if they waited on God long enough, he would arrive. You know, God, the scriptures don't really explain why, but God deemed it necessary for the early church to be birthed out of a hunger and an expectation that can only come by waiting. We, on the other hand, live in an age where we don't really like waiting, do we? Like, it's not our forte. It's definitely not my forte. Like, life is so busy, we want things when we want them. I went to um, order something on Amazon the other day. 
I mean, this might trouble you to hear, so I'm sorry if this is a triggering story for some of you, but I went to order something on Amazon and they didn't have next day delivery as an option. I know, I know, wipe those tears, dry those eyes. They didn't have next day delivery as an option. I was just sat looking at my screen like, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, like, what, like, honestly, what is this? Modern day travesty. But um, jokes aside, this is the reality. We live in this post-industrial, like, mega productive age. Like, time is money. And so we try to live as efficiently as possible so that we can achieve as much as possible. Like, an efficient life is a successful life. But it's such a modern frame of mind. Like, it really is. Like, every technological breakthrough we make as a society, you know, and we, and we see it now with AI, actually, um, which is incredible, the breakthroughs that are being terrifying at times as well, but incredible breakthroughs with AI. But rather than the narrative being like, guys, I want to be honest with you, AI is smashing it. Like, honestly, it's doing all of our jobs better than any of us could. To be honest, like, you could probably relax a little bit. Have a day off. Like, read a book. Um, have a longer holiday. Like, honestly, put your feet up. Let's AI, let be AI. Like, it's killing it, honestly. But instead... The narrative is more, AI is incredible. Do you know how much more you could achieve if you can use it right? Do you know how much more efficiently you could complete your work? How many more sales you would make? How many more people you would reach? How you could improve the efficiency of your organization? How you could improve the efficiency of your family life, maybe? Some of us are like, amen. You know, but this modern kind of thinking, it's like it's hardwired into our brains. It's just how we inhabit the world in this day and age. But the truth is that it often translates into a really bad spirituality. Like spirituality without waiting squeezes God out of our felt experience. I'll say that again. A spirituality without waiting squeezes God out of our everyday felt experience. Because it makes human action the, human action, the center of the story. Like life becomes about doing rather than about being. And there is a subtle belief in there that if we don't do, then God won't do. And it's one of the subtle lies of living in a secular society that has removed God from its consciousness. And it results in this drive to master the world rather than to receive the world. To be productive, to be efficient, to be effective. Like it shuts down the contemplative life that helps us to receive all of life as a gift. Filled with the glory and the goodness of God. And it's not that God doesn't work through human endeavor. Like, of course, we know that he does. But the question is whether that human endeavor is actually aligned with and responsive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Or whether there is space for God to move in our lives, perhaps in a way we never would have thought of. Whether there is sufficient space in our lives for God to actually break through the noise and speak to you, maybe in a way that might surprise you or upset you. Or convict you. You know, in the rest of Acts chapter 1, there's something really interesting to observe as a little interlude. And in the midst of their waiting, somewhere in that 10 day window, window Peter stands up and says, you know, out of the blue, somewhat, he says, you know what, we, uh, we need to replace Judas. Like he was the 12th apostle, he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, he fills in some of the gaps, he says, but we need to replace him with another apostle. You know, Jesus has instructed them to wait, he hasn't actually told them to do anything other than that. And now hear me, this is a bit speculative, okay? This is me reading between the lines. So like roll with me here a little bit. I'm reading between the lines a little bit. But at some point in that period of waiting, it's almost like Peter, as we saw recently, ever the impulsive one, he gets a bit antsy. It's like even he needs to do something productive. And so he gets up and he starts this whole process about how they're going to replace the 12th apostle. And Peter lays out the criteria for who can be an apostle. And they draw up a list of potential people and they narrow down the list of people. And then they draw lots and trust that God is going to decide the outcome. And at the end of the whole process, they've selected Matthias to be the 12th apostle. Well done, Matthias. Good job. And to be honest, it's like it's kind of this strange interlude in Acts chapter 1. Amidst this time of waiting, God hasn't yet turned up in the way they're believing for. So in the meantime, we should just keep ourselves a bit busy. Let's do something productive. And for a moment, in the absence of waiting, they kind of crack on and start making their own plans. And it's fascinating because I'm not saying that Matthias wasn't a legitimate apostle or any of those things. I'm, and I'm, I'm deliberately not drawing too many conclusions here. Uh, different commentaries speak about this event differently. There's different opinions. But what I do know is Matthias, the 12th apostle, 
chosen in Acts 1 by the apostles themselves, right at the start of the book. Do you know what happens the next time we hear about Matthias? Does anyone know? Like absolutely nothing because we never hear about him again. We never hear about the 12th apostle. We never hear again about Matthias. Not just in the book of Acts, but in the whole New Testament, Matthias never gets a mention. Nothing ever did or ever said was recorded. We have no more information about Matthias, the 12th, the 12th apostle. And we contrast that with the apostle Paul, who God himself seems to select as an apostle later in the book of Acts. And it turns out we end up hearing quite a lot about him as he writes half the New Testament. Now, as, as I say, whether you think we should draw conclusions from that, I, I, I don't know. But, but at the very least, I wonder how much of that is a metaphor for our own lives. How often has God asked us to wait, to wait on him, to trust him, like to pray, to persevere, to spend more time listening than speaking, to trust that he is going to arrive, to trust that he's going to exceed our expectations, to trust that his divine action is the main event. His divine action is actually what we need. But in the waiting, we get impatient. And we resort to our own devices, to our own methods for accomplishing what we want to accomplish. We resort to chat GPT. If that doesn't make sense, don't don't worry about it. (laughs) To efficiency, to effectiveness. You know, even if it's good and helpful, deep down we know that God has asked us to wait attentively on him and trust that he will come through. Like you can imagine after the short burst of productivity to select Matthias, they all just kind of go like, right, well, we've done that. I guess we should just kind of go back to waiting again. Well, 10 days of waiting go by and you can imagine the hunger, like the expectation that is brewing, maybe the impatience, maybe the doubt. Maybe God came on the 10th day because they were all about to go home on the 11th and he knew that and he thought we might miss out on the rest of the book of Acts. I don't know. But on 10, after 10 days of waiting, God arrives. He shows up and exceeds their expectations. And we remember it as the day of Pentecost, the day when they have this incredible encounter with the living God, with the Holy Spirit. Let me read the first few verses again. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing, him, hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And it continues in verse 12. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others said, they are filled with new wine. Now friends, we live in a time in which openness to spirituality is increasing. There is an increasing number of people in our society with a growing openness to spiritual encounters. You know, in that growing openness in their exploration of the mystical, in their openness to the idea of transcendence, the idea of something more than just what we can see. Like, you know, you go to any music festival or even just parts of London and you'll see people doing tarot card readings. There's an increasing traffic towards things like psychic readings, psychic experiences. You have more people going to certain parts of the world and taking certain substances that facilitate what they would call otherworldly experiences. The challenge for us is that when people in our day are thinking of spiritual encounter, they're not necessarily thinking of the church. The church isn't often high on the list of places that people might associate with encounters of a spiritual nature, which is challenging, right? And I think it's like, it's fascinating, but it's also a challenge for us. Like, even as we were getting ready this morning, as we were traveling into this very building, if we asked ourselves what what was going on in our minds and in our heads, what were we expecting when we arrived? You know, how many of us as followers of Jesus were arriving here this morning thinking and ready and expectant, I'm expecting to encounter the Holy Spirit. I'm expecting to encounter the living God. 
I'm expecting to experience something of his living presence, to have my body filled with his spirit, to hear his voice, to be moved by him, to be changed, to be transformed, to experience something of his power. And I wonder if people don't necessarily associate spiritual encounter with the church because we ourselves have become distracted. Or maybe we've settled for less than we should have. Maybe we've settled for too little. Like, can you imagine coming to church hoping, potentially, to meet the creator of the universe? Like, it sounds ridiculous. This wild, eternal being, and you end up settling for me with a microphone. Like, what a disappointment, honestly. Like, you've absolutely been shortchanged. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, there is so much more for us that is available. And I think this morning, God wants to provoke a hunger in us for more of him. I don't know if you've, um, if you've ever done the Alpha course. Um, but almost every... Has people done the Alpha course in the room? Show of hands. Oh, yeah, strong. Good number. Go church. Um, but almost every time I've ever done the Alpha course, you go through the various weeks and the various conversations, and it's beautiful, and community is formed, and it's great. All good stuff. And eventually, you come to the weekend away or the Alpha Day, or the Holy Spirit Weekend, or whatever you called it when you did Alpha. And people generally know on the Holy Spirit Weekend, something is coming, that we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and meet with us, and that they can do that if they want to. People generally have a vague awareness of it. And people are often a little bit dubious. You know, they're not so sure. Um, And every time, there's always, there's usually that one person, you know the person, the mega skeptic, um, that maybe they're an atheist, They're usually like an engineer or a physicist or something. I get it. And they somewhat reluctantly go along with it. You know, they're a bit like, oh, yeah, all right. I mean, if this is real, yeah, I guess I'm open to it. I'll pray the prayer. And you're kind of there on Alpha being like, I mean, okay, that wasn't quite believable. I don't like... I don't know if this is going to happen for you. It feels like they should at least require a little bit of faith in there somewhere. I don't know. But maybe curiosity will be enough for today. We'll see. So you pray anyway, Holy Spirit, simple prayer, non-coercive, freedom, Holy Spirit, come and fill this person. And in that moment, I have seen grown, hardened men reduced to tears, like weeping, overcome as they are overwhelmed by the power and the love of the Holy Spirit. And every time there's like this shock as they get this revelation of like, oh my gosh, like Jordan, like this is actually real. And like, no, yeah, no, no, I know. Like, I know. It's great, isn't it? It's cool. And like, no, no, you don't understand. Like, this is actually real. Like, I felt it. I encountered God. Like, you don't get it. It's like, no, no, what do you think we've been doing this whole time? Like, no, I get like, I get it. It's real. It's amazing. But they have this encounter with the living God who shows up and meets them where they're at. And it all gets very real, very fast. And here in Acts 2, when the authors write about the Holy Spirit, as is often the case throughout the scriptures, it gets very real. They're waiting for the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit shows up. And when he shows up, as you see throughout the Bible, he engages the totality of the human experience. It's physical, it's emotional, he engages the heart, he engages the body, he engages the mind. But the Holy Spirit engages with us in a real way, in a way that perhaps some of us might find the idea of a little bit uncomfortable. But this is really important. He engages with us in a way that is coherent with the humans that he has created us to be. He engages with us in a way that is coherent with the humans he has created us to be. It's not just conceptual. It's not cerebral. It's not informative or it's not just informative. Sometimes as Christians in church, we have settled too often for the cerebral, for information. We have settled too often simply for an acceptable sermon or or a good enough band or the songs that we liked that morning. When there is also a real God who shows up to encounter his people in a living, real way. And in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, we read that when the Holy Spirit came, he engages the whole human experience. There was a sound like a rushing wind and it filled the whole house. So it sounded like something. And it's a wind, so it probably felt like something. And then they saw tongues of fire rest on each of them. So it also looked like something. Like this is a pretty wild experience. The Holy Spirit is engaging all of the senses. And then as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, 
They began to speak in other languages that they didn't, they didn't previously know, as the Spirit empowered them. So the Spirit is kind of taking over their bodies a little bit, or at least empowering them to do something they couldn't do before. Like, this is wild. And then, as you'd expect, a large crowd starts to gather when they hear all this commotion. And you're like, yeah, no doubt. And the text says they were amazed and astonished. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And commentators disagree on exactly what's happening here. Is the miracle that they are speaking in languages they didn't know? Or is the miracle that people are hearing them in their own language? Was it a miracle of speech or was it a miracle of interpretation? I don't think it matters. I don't know. Maybe you might have a different opinion. Maybe it's a miracle of both. Probably was. But either way, the Holy Spirit is miraculously empowering something supernatural as he fills them with his presence. And it grabs everybody's attention. An encounter with the Holy Spirit draws a crowd. People come to listen. Some people watching on, their only explanation, well, yeah, and as he does that, whatever is happening, it's worth noting, it's also a bit weird. It's a bit uncomfortable. It's a bit out of, an, out of ordinary. Some people watching on, their only explanation is that they must be drunk. That's what's happened. They must be drunk. They th- they, like, you know, they've all been on the Merlot already and they've overindulged. But some of them understand that something miraculous is happening that cannot be explained. And as a crowd gathers, Peter makes the most of a captive audience. And he gets up to preach the first sermon ever at the birth of the church. The first sermon with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The first sermon of the Christian church. And Peter gets up and the first thing he says, which this, sorry, this is my sense of humor. I love that the first sermon in the history of the church, Peter's first was like, we're not drunk, I promise. If ever I get, anyway, sorry, that's a strange sense of humor. But the first thing he says is like, it's not drunk, it's only 9 a.m. Honestly, what do you take us for? And Peter goes on to quote a passage from the book of Joel. And I know for time, we don't have, I don't have time to go into all of the text today. But he goes on to quote a passage from the book of Joel in the Old Testament. A passage that was written hundreds of years before this moment. And he says, this passage is being fulfilled in front of you today. Like God said, hundreds of years ago, he would pour out his spirit. He said people would prophesy. People would have visions. He said people would have these encounters with the Holy Spirit. And what you are seeing in front of you is the fulfillment of what was written hundreds of years ago. The day has arrived. And Peter uses this passage as a means of describing what Jesus has done. Like this encounter you're seeing right now is another piece of evidence that God came in Jesus Christ. He died, he rose again, he's now ascended, and now that he is exalted at the right hand of God, he is doing what he promised he would do. He is pouring out his spirit on his church to be his hands and feet in the world. He says this is yet again another piece of evidence that it is in Jesus that you find life, that when you call on his name, you find new life. And Jesus has done something that is very different from every other religion in the world. Every religion in the world tells you that what you should do and not do. Tells you how you can become a more moral person. But this is not what Jesus has done. Jesus has made a new humanity. Right? He's pierced through the veil of death. He has shown he is alive and that his spirit is still moving in the world. Like following Jesus is unique to every other religion in the world because he has seen through death. He has been through it and came back from it, and has power over it. Like the people listening to Peter hear that they were responsible for this death, and and it says they were cut to the heart. Like they're devastated. And they ask, brothers, what shall we do? Like what a great question. Like if this is true, if this is true, what shall we do? And Peter's answer is this. The response is really simple, is to receive his forgiveness, to turn away from your old lives, and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To receive forgiveness, to turn away from your old life, and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is what is so different about Christianity. All the other religions on the planet train you into how to be a good enough person so that you can get into their version of heaven whatever that might look like, however it's defined. 
The fundamental premise of Christianity is that there's no one good enough that they were ever going to get there. Christianity is not how you can be good enough to get into heaven. It's about what God has done to get heaven into you. It's a, it's a fundamental distinction. Christianity is not about... how you can be good enough to get into heaven. It's about what God has done to get heaven into you. And the call this morning is every morning is to put your trust in Jesus and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's as they do this that the Acts 2 church is born 2,000 years ago. They waited, devoting themselves to prayer. They encountered and received the Holy Spirit. And then this is what the Holy Spirit empowered them to do. Like, could it be that if the modern church isn't embodying this way of life as the early church did, that it's partly because we're not waiting on God enough? Because we're all too much of a rush, in too much of a rush, maybe even on a Sunday morning. Could it be because we're not encountering the reality of his presence? Because we're not being filled with the Holy Spirit enough? We're not living lives of surrender to his Spirit. Like, friends, may we not settle for anything less. Don't just settle for an okay sermon or a coffee and a nice catch-up with your other Christian friends. May we be filled with his Holy Spirit so that we can be empowered to be his hands and feet in the world. The Apostle Paul would later go on to write in his letter to the Ephesians. I'm nearly done. Maybe the band could come up. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And find a point of detail. Be filled with the Spirit here is written in the present active, which for the grammar nerds amongst us basically means it's not a one-time event, but it's an ongoing thing. If I say my heart is beating, you're not expecting me to go, oh, there it was again, there it was again. You know, my heart's been beating My heart is beating, and my heart will keep beating, God willing. So it might literally be translated like, keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Wake up in the morning, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Have a lunch break, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Go for a walk, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Like, Put your kids to bed, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a simple, but it's a bold prayer because it requires your surrender. It requires getting out the way. Do you want to be filled with the Spirit? Are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to let Him in? And maybe, because when He comes in, maybe He starts to push around your desires a little bit. Maybe make you think a little bit differently. Maybe it makes you start to act a little bit differently. Start to empower you, maybe in supernatural ways. Like, are we willing to let Him in our lives and maybe start shaking things up a little bit? Are we willing to let go of control? Let go of the things that we so desperately want to cling to? Are we willing to wait on him until he shows up in power? The Christian life um, is actually, it's like, I know it can be tough, especially in our day and age. It can be challenging, but in many ways, it's actually like shockingly simple, isn't it? The more we surrender each and every day, the more we lay down control and invite the Holy Spirit to come and fill us, the more we live out of his power, live out of our identity in him the more we're able to become an embodiment of that presence to a world that desperately needs to encounter the presence of God. Let's pray together.